During the time stepping loop, it looks like we can perform regular updates on all of the components, except for the very first one, as before, that's true even for an unparallelized code, but now we also can't perform a regular update on the last easy component on processor zero, which is easy five. For the easy five update, processor zero is missing the HY to the right which is HY5, which is over here. HY5 is on processor one. So this means that before the EZs are updated, we need to make sure that processor one sends the value of HY5 from the previous half time step over to processor zero. Now we could create an extra variable to hold that HY5 value, but what if this were a two-dimensional or three-dimensional code? It could quickly become tedious to keep track of the extra field components sent between processors and where they are located in the grid. As a result, it turns out to be helpful to just make the HY array on processor zero larger by one value. So that is when we create the HY array on processor zero, HY, we should have it go from one to five instead of one to four. The fifth value here of the HY array will be called what is, it'll be what's called a ghost cell or a ghost field component, meaning we store that value, but we don't update it on processor zero. Then on processor one, we can perform all regular updates on all the components except for the last easy, but again that's true for an unparallelized code as well, but also now we can't perform a regular update on this HY, which is HY5. To update this HY5 component, the EZ component to the left is missing, the one that would be right here. And that is EZ5. This means before the HYs are updated, we need to send EZ5 here from processor zero over to processor one. And the best way to store that value in its proper place is to make the EZ array on processor one extend from, so this is EZ, extend from I equal five to 10 instead of just six to 10. The easy value at I equal five will also be, this one right here will be a ghost field component, which won't be updated on processor one. It will only be stored there so that we can update this HY5. Let's explore in more detail how we will actually exchange the electric and magnetic field values between the processors during the time stepping loop. To send data between processors, we're going to use what's called Message Passing Interface, or MPI. MPI is a standardized library that was designed by a group of researchers from academia and industry for use on all kinds of supercomputers. The first version of MPI appeared around 1992. Basically, an MPI code works like this. At first, all the processors start reading through the executable which is created when you compile your code. So at this point, the processors are not aware of each other. And the code is a serial code. Once you initialize the MPI environment, so here we're going to in initialize the MPI environment. At this point, the parallel code begins. All the processors are still reading through the executable independently, but they are aware of the other processors and they can communicate with them. Next, you can do a bunch of work, you know, whatever calculations you want the processors to complete. And then at some point, we would finalize the MPI environment, and at that point, the parallel code is done and the code becomes serial.
a serial code again. And then lastly, the serial code ends at the very end of the code. In the next slides, we will dive into the details of adding MPI to your code and distributing the work between the two processors. Before we get started, make a copy of your Fortran code that you created last time. Maybe you'll want to call this new file FDTD MPI or something like that, uh, MPI.F90 or similar. We want to make sure we save a working version of the Fortran code so we can revert back to it later if we ever need to. First, we want to allow the code to access the MPI library. So to do this, we're going to add include mpif.h with these single quotes around it. That's at the beginning of our code on the line immediately after implicit none. Next, we're going to initialize the MPI environment. And this is the point in your code where the program will change from a serial code to a parallel code, meaning the processors will be aware of each other starting at this point. To initialize the MPI environment, add to the code after declaring all the variables. So here, there's a section where we declare the variables and the arrays. But before you start assigning them values or allocating space to them, add call mpi underscore init, I-N-I-T. And here we're going to put I-E-R-R. -R. That is just an error flag. So if there are any problems with initializing the MPI environment, I-E-R-R -R will be given a value that we could then check if we wanted to. On the next line, you can write call MPI com and rank. And here we're going to put MPI com world and ID this and the error flag again. This MPI library call assigns all the available processors available to us for our job or as we call it in the world of our simulation, a unique rank or ID number, which we're calling ID this. Since we have two processors, the ID this rank of our processors will be zero or one. So ID this on processor zero will be equal to zero, and ID this on processor one will be equal to one. Lastly, type call MPI com size and here again we're going to have MPI com world so all the processors num p and the error flag again and this call assigns a value to the variable num p which stores the total number of processors available to us in our communicating world of MPI. So for our simulation, numP will be equal to 2, because we have two processors. Here's a summary of what I wrote on the previous slide. Now, in these three MPI calls, we've introduced some new variables. So now we need to go back to the beginning of our code, where we declare all the variables in the code, and we need to declare these new ones. And these are all integers. So we need to declare integer, the error flag, I-E-R-R, -R. Uh, also ID this, which is going to have the processor number, and the total number of processors, numP. Notice here that we don't need to declare MPI com world, and this is because the MPI library already knows what it is. Next, in our time-stepping loop, we want processor 0 to update and store only the EZ and HY fields on the left side of our grid. And we want processor 1 to update 
and store only the EZ and HY fields on the right side of our grid. So this is the dividing line of our grid. We have processor 0 and processor 1. This means we need to define new starting and ending I indices for the EZ array and the HY array. And not only that on processor 0 and on processor 1. And not only that, we need to know the starting and ending I indices for updating versus storing, since we have ghost cells, each field component. Spend a minute and write out how you would keep track of these indices on each processor and what exactly the storing versus updating starting and ending indices would be for the EZ and the HY fields on each processor. So we have updating versus storing. We have the starting I index, and we also need to keep track of the ending I index. And we need to keep track of EZ indices versus HY indices.